Protectors of the Suna Suna Baba Protector of the Suna Welcome to another session of our Akita class. And we have been studying what it means to believe in Allah. The true meaning of Tawheed. The true meaning of Akita. Two Arabic words that every Muslim on this planet should be familiar with. What's the difference between the Arabic word Akida and the difference between the Arabic word Tawheed? Who can tell us? What's the difference between when we talk about Tawheed, what are we speaking about? When we speak about Akida, what are we speaking about? Who can explain the difference between the two? Go ahead. Sister Elma, what's the difference between Tawheed and Akita? Go ahead, Elma. Oh, Elma's here. Go ahead, Elma. <laughs> um, Akita is belief in Allah. And Tawheed is um, worship in Allah alone. Almost got it. Almost got it. Good job, though. Almost. She almost got it right. Go ahead and help her out. Who can else? Um... What's the difference between when we speak about Akita, what are we speaking about? And when we speak about Tawheed, what are we speaking about? Uh, let's see, who else? Go ahead, Tony. Uh, when we're speaking about Tawheed, that, that means that uh, we're speaking about the oneness of Allah. And when we're speaking about Akita, we're talking about the, your belief system. MashaAllah, that's the difference. So I want y'all to remember, Akita is our belief system. That's everything. What do we believe in as Muslims? Okay. We believe, what do we believe in as Muslims? Who can answer that? That's another question. Who can answer that? If a person asks me, what is my Akita? What is, what is my belief system? How would you respond? Uh, how would you respond to the question of what is your belief system? Who can answer that? Just basic terminology I want y'all to really put in your uh, hearts so that when you don't look, you know, I, it really bothers me when I see some Arabic speaking people make fun. They make fun of non-Arabic speaking people. Y'all know I don't play that. Mm -mm. I don't like it. They laugh. You want to laugh because a non-Arabic person doesn't understand the meaning of your a word It's in a language that you don't even speak properly, but you celebrate birthdays. That person ain't celebrating no birthdays. You are. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Latifa. What do we believe in? Okay. Inshallah, we believe that Allah is one and he is the only one that's worthy of worship that he is the creator of all things and he knows about all things. He has knowledge of all things and that um, he also, um, Allah's essence is through his attributes. Okay, what do you guys think about her answer? The question was, what is our belief system? Did she answer that correctly, guys? Anybody, what do y'all think? Yes or no? Did she? They all scared. Zaytun, did she answer it correctly? A teacher and another teacher. Both of these sisters are teachers. Did she answer it correctly? She said, if a, if a person asks you, what do you believe? What is your belief system? Did her, was her answer correct for the belief system? What do you think, Sister Khadijah? Khadijah, do you think her answer was okay? Was correct? I don't know. 
You don't know. Okay. Sister Medina, what do you think? Medina? Lucy? I didn't hear her answer. Sorry. Okay. You, you were answer. praying. Okay. Her question. answer. Yeah. Her, the question is, if a person asks you, what is our belief system? What would you say, Medina? If I asked you, what is our belief system? What do we believe in? What would you say? What do you Muslims believe? What would you say? What would your answer be, Medina? I'm sure people ask you that all the time. Muslims. Um, yeah, go ahead. We believe in the um, oneness of Allah. That's it? What, what do you guys think? Go ahead, Brother Noor. What would your answer be? If I asked you, what do you believe in as a Muslim? What is your belief system? What do you believe in? How would you respond, Brother Noor? Go ahead. There's only one God and not Allah, which is Allah and Muhammad, which is Allah, which is the last messenger. Okay. Anyone else want to try? Anyone else? Okay, your answers are wrong. Okay, Latifa, you had the right answer, but not for that question. Remember, we're speaking about the difference between Akida and Tawheed. Tawheed refers to the oneness of Allah, belief in Allah and his oneness. Akida refers to our belief system, what we believe in. Who wants to try it again before I give the answer? Because this is sad that I've been teaching this and you guys still can't get it. Lucy, go ahead. I'm going to try it. We believe in the oneness of Allah. We also believe in the angels, believe in all the prophets that come before it, believe in, um, oh, I can't. I don't stop. I just my mind is gone again. But we believe in those. We believe in the angels. We believe in the prophets. We believe in the oneness of Allah. We believe that the Quran was the last book, and we believe the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of all prophets. She almost there, Anissa. If a person were to ask you, "What do you believe in as a Muslim? What is your belief system? What would your answer be, Anissa?" I believe in the oneness of Allah. There's no God but Allah. There's nothing like Allah. He's the originator. I believe in the prophets that he sent and the books that he sent with them. I believe in the angels. I believe in the day of resurrection. I believe in the day of judgment. That's the answer you guys are supposed to give. I want all of you, Medina, Brother Noor, Latifa, you almost got it right. You had the wrong answer. I want every Muslim listening to me to write that down because a lot of you are giving the wrong information to people. When people ask about our belief system, you don't, you're supposed to tell them our belief system is based upon believing in Allah as the only one worthy of worship. And we also believe in his angels and his books and all the prophets that he sent. We also believe in paradise and in hell. And we also believe in the, on the day of judgment. And we also believe that everything that happens, happens because God willed it. That, the, that's the foundations of our faith. Those are the five, the, the pillars, the six pillars of faith or the six pillars of belief. Every time I ask that, you guys get it wrong, and I don't understand that. So you guys are gonna have to remember that your belief system is believing in Allah and everything he told us to believe in. You gotta believe in his books, the original ones. You have to believe in his prophets, his angels, paradise, hell, judgment day, and the Carter. That's what we believe. Now, what is it that we believe about God? Who can answer that? 
If a Christian or an atheist or a Hindu or a Buddhist came to you and say, what do you, do you believe in a supreme being? Do you believe in God? What would you say? What is your belief system founded on in regards to belief in God? How would you respond to that one? Anybody? You want to try it again now, Latifa? Go ahead. Okay. I think the other answer I gave was kind of based you upon that. The, the correct okay, your so answer you, was for tall heed. Yes. Right. Okay. So your belief is that um, Allah exists and that Allah is the only one and the only one worthy of worship, that uh, Allah is the creator of all things. Allah has knowledge of all things. Allah is the only one. Um, Allah, uh, his essence yes. depend, is defined through his uh, attributes. Right. He's the sole provider, all of that, mm -hmm. all of that. So don't get it twisted. When okay. people ask you about your belief system, that's when you t tell them about the pillars of faith. When they ask you about a law, that's when you tell them about the, the, the things we covered about a law, how he, he's the creator of all things. How he tells us of himself through his attributes, how he's the sole provider. Okay. How he, nothing happens unless he wills it to happen. All those things that we spoke about with that. Everybody get it? Next time I ask this question, y'all need to pay attention more because every Muslim should know these answers. And this is why I tell y'all, be careful. A lot of us, we have to understand that Shaitan doesn't want us to learn the correct belief system. He doesn't want you guys to know this stuff because Shaitan knows that in order to get through the punishment of the grave, it ain't based on your good deeds. All the fasting that you're doing, all the charity that you're giving, none of that matters if your belief system is not correct. So Shaitan wants you to focus on learning how to read Quran, which ain't going to help you. You can read Quran till your heart falls out. If you don't believe la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, and what it implies, it don't, it don't count because the Christian Arabs read Quran too. They use it. They the ones that's going around trying to refute what we do. Okay. So y'all have to, you know, focus on the right stuff. Just like I told you about shirk. Shaitan doesn't want you to understand what shirk is. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Once a person understands what belief in Allah entails, that's Tawheed or Rabubia. And when we're teaching Tawheed or Rabubia, what are we teaching the people? What things are we teaching them about Allah? Who can answer that question again? We went over this yesterday. Let's see if it's in your heart yet. When we break down Tawheed into uh, Tawheed or Rabubia, which is the first category that speaks about the lordship of Allah, what are we teaching the people about Allah? Go ahead, Jalusi. We're talking about his, his lordship, his um, being the creator, provider. He's the only one that can make laws and, and change laws. Good. Once we teach the people these things, guys, about Allah, that's when we go into shirk. Because there's things that we say and do that invalidate belief in Allah's lordship. You guys saw it here at the website all last week. That brother hasn't been back either. But you guys have seen how this young brother, I wish he'd come back because he's a good brother and I want him to learn, but he left out of here not you know, with a veil over him and Shaitan just took him away. The last thing he said was that he was called a Kafir and you guys know I've never called him a Kafir. That's what Shaitan wanted him to believe so as he don't uh, uh, come back 
and he was a good brother and I could tell he really wanted to learn, okay? But this is what Shaitan does to us, guys. Okay, this is what Shaitan does to us. He wants us to focus on other things and puts a veil over our hearts. And when he sees, let me uh, hold on for a second, brother Tarek, you ready, Tarek? Uh, uh, Yasmin and Tarek, you guys here? I need moderators in the Zoom room too. Yes. Okay, I just made you a moderator. Keep your eyes on uh, the names coming in here because I just see some names. That's... And let me make sure I got the other thing cut off too. Yeah, it's off. It's just me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So again, guys, when Shaitan sees that you guys are learning the truth, that you're getting your belief system together, he gets angry. Your personal gen, he gets angry. So he tries to put all kind of bad thoughts in your mind to make you hear things that people didn't say to make you believe things that they didn't say because again that personal gen assigned to you Allah put him there for a reason to try to get you to see if you will follow Allah or not and his job is to see if he can take you to hell with him that gin, your personal gin already knows he's going to hell. Just like Shaitan knows he's going to hell. But that gin's job is to try to take you with him. So he's going to work hard, work very, very hard, you know, to get you to believe the opposite of Tawheed. And unfortunately, uh, most Muslims today are living their lives opposite Tawheed. So this is why today we're going to focus on what shirk is, the different types of, of shirk. First of all, does anybody know what shirk means? I want one of my students here to explain what is the meaning of the word shirk. What does shirk mean? It's to associate partners with Allah. Exactly. Shirk basically in English refers to associating uh, partners with the law. And what a lot of Muslims are not aware of is that there's different, different uh, categories of shirk, different categories of associating partners. You know, a lot of Muslims think that to associate partners with a law simply means to worship a statue. No. We commit association with our tongues all the time. We commit association by celebrating people that we shouldn't celebrate, uh, eulogizing, eulogizing people. Uh, that's a haram. We don't eulogize. Uh, that's uh, over glorifying, over praising. That's putting someone on a level. That's what birthdays are. Okay. So we're gonna now go into shirk and what it is. Okay, so let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. And by the way, I did post up uh, the pages. I hope you guys read along in the book because uh, Sheikh Kareem Abouze did a good job uh, breaking down uh, this first uh, category of shirk that we're gonna talk about today. Shirk or association in Allah's Lordship. This is shirk and tawheed or rabubia. Okay. And I like how Sheikh Kareem Abouze, he does uh, like me as far as trying to break these words down in simpler terms. Once you learn what it means to worship Allah alone, once you learn that Allah is the creator, the sole provider, that only he has the a power uh, uh, to make laws, to make things lawful and unlawful, and all those things we've been talking about. Once you understand that component of Tawheed or Rabubia, it becomes necessary, guys, to educate yourself as to what shirk is. Listen to what Allah says. In the interpretation of the meaning, Allah forgives not that partners be set up with him in worship, but he will forgive anything else to whomever he pleases. And whoever sets up partners with Allah in worship has indeed invented a tremendous sin. So your personal jinn knows this. 
Remember, your personal gen is already, he knows he's going to hell. There is no forgiveness for him. He's one of the denizens of Shaitan. He's already damned and he knows it. But he's going to try to take as take you with him. So he knows that Allah will forgive anything but shirk. And he knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows that you're not educated enough to know what shirk is. Okay. And so what does shirk mean linguistically? It means partnership. It means sharing or association. It comes from the Arabic root word that means that. Islamically, it refers to the act of assigning partners to a law in whatever form it can be, whether implicit or explicit, whether internal or external. And in English, it may mean it, it comes from a verb that means to go stealthily, to sneak, to sneak or evade the performance. And this is what your gen does, like that birthday stuff. It sneaks up on you. It sneaks up on you. Just like in the beginning, the Arabs used to worship Allah, okay? When Prophet Abraham, alayhi salam, left his son, Ismail, and his wife, Hajar, in the desert, they were taken in by the Arabs of Mecca. And, the, and Prophet Abraham prayed to Allah to make Mecca a sanctity. And those people followed the teachings of Ismail. Ismail and Abraham built, laid down the, the, uh, the, built the foundations, rebuilt the Kaaba. And the people started making pilgrimage there to worship Allah. The, the, the Arabs in, in were, were, they were upon the true Tawheed in the beginning. But shirk snuck up on them. It's sn just like it sneak, it, it snuck up on Muslims today with this birthday. When those three righteous men died amongst them, Shaitan took on the appearance of an old man and came to their people and said, why don't you build a statue so we don't forget, forget these men? And that's what they did. They built a statue. That's how it sneaks up. Just like the birthday stuff. Well, why don't we just, you know, the kid, she, it's just a, she's just a kid. You know, we're not praying to her. She understands that we, that we're Muslim and we worship Allah. It's just a, it's just a cake, just a, you know, to celebrate the fact that she's still living. The fact that you said that you're celebrating the fact she's still living. That's worship. That's shirk. <laughs> but but we don't think of it like that. You know? So Shaitan, your personal gen will sneak up on you in your heart because he knows your strengths and weaknesses. And he will put those thoughts, whisper those thoughts into your heart. It's just a little cake. It's just a what's wrong with buying Allah likes presents. All I'm doing is giving her presents because she was born. And isn't that a good thing? That's just how Shaitan did them. Isn't it a good thing to remember them? And then Shaitan said, well, okay, let's talk to him. I mean, we know that Allah is the one that answers dua, but let's just talk to the statues. Let's give the statues names. You know, that's how shirk sneaks up on you. And that's how your gin implants it in your heart because he knows that's the one sin that if you die upon, it don't matter how many good deeds you did, you're not a believer because Allah does not want us to give homage to anyone but him, not your children, not your father, not your mother, not even yourself. Like the prophet told Umar, Umar, you into you love Allah and then me more than you do yourself. You will never be a believer. 
Okay, so remember, and then Allah is so merciful, guys. He tells us these things. He tells us beware of Shaitan and his denizens. Beware of how he will sneak whispers into your heart to make you assign partners to me. Then Allah tells us in the Quran, beware of your children, beware of your wives, beware of everything that you love, because everything you love in this world is a test for you. And shaitan will use it as a means of standing between you and me. Allah tells us this, but we don't pay heed. We don't read the Quran and ponder the meaning no more. That's what the prophet meant when he said the Quran will disappear. And by the way, this is a question I got. How will the Quran disappear? It won't disappear off the earth. It will disappear from the heart. It will be just like you see people doing today. Look how many people can recite the Quran, but don't know what they're saying. They don't understand none of the words in it. They will sit there and memorize how to sing, but they don't understand that birthdays is celebrating uh, uh, someone, putting someone on a pedal equal to a law. That person did nothing. It's not like you're rewarding them. That's not a reward. That's not a charity. This is an act of worship. I'm giving you gifts just because you exist. That's what we do for a lot of people, not each other. So that's how the Quran will disappear from this earth. It'll leave the heart of man. Man will recite it and sing it, but don't understand what he's saying. And that's what we're doing today. We are that generation that our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, warned about. Okay, so that's what shirk means. And it will sneak up on you and stand between even the way you perform your obligations. This is why the prophet told us, be careful even when you pray. Because your jinn is going to whisper and try to get you to show off when you're praying. And when we show off, that's a form of, of association too. Because instead of doing my prayer for a law, I'm doing it to be seen of the people. Y'all see? Y'all see how it sneaks up. Even for a person like me, I'm teaching dawah. I'm giving dawah on the internet. Shaitan can sneak up and say, show off. Do it to show people just how intelligent you are. Do it just because you want to get rich and famous. You know, it sneaks up on us. So that's the meaning of, of this term. And I really like the way Sheikh Kareem Abouzaid broke it down like that. So shirk or association in regards to the lordship of Allah, what does it mean? It means to believe that others besides Allah create or share control over his creation. Okay, let me give an example of that. Okay, you want to say, oh, um, say, for example, you have a total knee replacement surgery. You have total knee replacement surgery. And after your surgery, you thank your doctor. You say, oh, thank you for creating a new knee for me. You created a better knee for me. Oh, no, the doctor didn't create that knee for you. Okay, because it didn't have to take. Allah gave the doctor the knowledge of how to take tools and assemble them together to replicate your knee. But if Allah willed it, that your knee, your, your body could have rejected it. So the doctor is not the creator. But if you think your doctor is a, like Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein, he was a, he calls himself a creator. Oh, a stock for Allah. Allah is the creator. So uh, uh, to work, to associate partners in regards to the lordship of Allah entails believing that someone other than Allah can bring uh, a control or create control over his creation. It also means that you're saying that someone other than Allah can bring benefit or harm to you. This is another big one today. A lot of you fear to fear someone more than Allah. A lot of the new sisters here, the new shahadas, 
they'll come and say, oh, Sister Layla, I don't want to wear a hijab. Why? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I start wearing a hijab and covering my body, the people are going to attack me. I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get hung. I'm going to be looked at as a terrorist. So I'm going to disobey a law. This is associating partners. So you fear the people more than you do a law to the point that you will disobey your Lord. Y'all see, that's how shirk your personal gin, he whispers in your heart and makes it sneak up on you that you won't fulfill your obligation of wearing hijab because you, are, you fear the people too much. Or a lot of Muslims today, a big problem, especially with African-American Muslims here, you don't go to the doctor. You don't go to the doctor to take care of yourself because you're afraid that medicine, that the white man is giving you medicine to try to kill you. Also, some of the Arabs here. I know a lot of Arabs who have not taken the COVID vaccination. Why? Because you think that America's putting chips in your body you know, to track you. You're afraid that they're gonna track you and kill you because you're Palestinian or because you're from Syria or because, because, because. What type of garbage is this? Allah commands us to take medicine. Allah tells us that sickness don't come from the white man. Sickness don't come from America. America ain't got no control over that. Allah says sickness comes from him and he spreads it through the wings of the jinn. We got jinn that fly through the sky. If Allah wants a pandemic to happen, he'll create a sickness and the jinn will spread it through the sky to everybody. Allah says, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He said, because guess what? I never send a sickness without sending a treatment. He doesn't say cure. He says treatment. He said, take the treatment when I reveal it. And if you take the treatment that I reveal, then maybe, maybe I'll give you knowledge of the cure because there's a cure for every sickness except death. That's what Allah says, but you got to know the Hadith to know that. You can't just read the Quran and think that everything's there. The prophet broke that down for us in an authentic Hadith, and that's the Hadith, Sahih Muslim, okay? So, you know, but even though our prophet told us this, and the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever the companions got sick, he would make them go to a doctor. He would tell them, go see the doctor. They had doctors then. The first um, hospital was attached to the mosque. The prophet's apartments, the prophet's uh, wives all had apartments attached to the mosque. Abu Bakr had an apartment attached to the mosque. Umar's apartment was attached. And on the other side was the hospital. So if a person came complaining of a, of a physical sickness, the prophet would refer them to the hospital. And by the way, Aisha was a nurse. Um Salama was a nurse too. And I think Hafsa was as well, okay? So, you know, the prophet said, when you get sick, physical sickness, seek the attention of a doctor. Because Allah always reveals to us a treatment. The knowledge of this vaccine to help with the COVID came from Allah. He sent it to the knowledge into the heads of the CDC people. Just like he put that knowledge into the heads of, of, of any other doctors, okay? But we got Muslims today that don't get medical treatment because they think it's a conspiracy. Like, who are you? Who do you think you are that somebody wants to conspire? You ain't nobody. You're too ignorant. If America or anybody else wanted to take out a people, it wouldn't be you. 
It would be somebody as a threat to them. The fact that you are too stupid to get a vaccine. You are too stupid to take medicine when you're sick. Don't nobody care about you. You ain't no threat to nobody but yourself. But that's how we Muslims are here in America. A lot of these African-Americans and Arabic Muslims in America are stupid like that. They think everything is against them and they fear America and they fear the white man more than they fear Allah Almighty. This is shirk. That's associating partners with Allah. Allah said, get the treatment. Get the vaccine. How many of you ain't had it? If you ain't had the vaccine because you afraid of a chip or a white man, shirk. Hello. There it is. Okay, so this is a, another thing. You think that someone other than a law has the power to benefit or harm you to the point where you'll even disobey your Lord. This is associating partners with a law, guys. Also, good luck. How many of you heard Muslims speak about good luck? How many of you know Muslims that wear a uh, uh, ayat corsi around their neck, tying strings around themselves or their children? reciting Quran over the strings and then drinking water, putting the string in water thinking it's going to, girl, let me tell you something. Most ridiculous phone call I got was from a sister. She and her whole family had COVID. This when COVID had first come out. Her children had it. She had it, her husband. And she called me, couldn't talk Harley. And she says, Sister Layla, I got the COVID. All of us do. And we keep reciting the Quran and soaking and soaking strings in water. We even took my husband even went out and bought a Quran and cut the pages out and soaked it in the water and we drinking it, but we still sick. My my baby is on a on a ventilator. I said, Who told you to do this stupidity? I said, get your behind to a hospital. Are you crazy? Who told you that if you uh, soak the Quran in water and drink it, it's going to cure you of your sickness? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the Quran is a cure for what ails the heart, not the body. He said whatever ails you in your body, seek medical attention. The Quran is only a cure for diseases of the heart like weakness of faith, ignorance of the religion. It has nothing to do with curing you of cancer, uh, COVID, uh, or anything else, guys. And I told that sister, I say, you're crazy. This is, you know, where did this come from? So reciting Quran over strings and reciting Quran over talismans, thinking it's gonna protect you from evil, all of this is shirk. Allah told us how to protect ourselves against evil. Like the prophet said, if you're sick, seek medical attention. If it's physical, if it's spiritual sickness, we seek it through the Quran. And the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us many different uh, supplications that we can say, you know, to help us if we're spiritually sick. Does everybody get it? Spiritually sick, not physically. That's why when these Muslims come to you saying, can you uh, do rukia over me? I've had sisters do that too. Oh, Sister Layla, can you do rukia over me? No, you do rukia over yourself. When I got sick, okay, Oh, I want to come and do rookie on you. Oh, no, you don't. I do my own rookie. I don't need nobody to recite Quran over me. I recite Quran for myself. And that's what you need to do. Learn to recite Quran for yourself when you're sick. Because a lot of people commit shirk with that too. They think that the shake has the power to heal them. There are Sufis that believe that. 
There's some different Sufi groups and Shiite groups that believe that their saint, their sheikh, can cure you by reciting Quran. No, we don't do that here. You do rukia over yourself, okay? Recite Quran over yourself. All right. So those are different types of uh, shows you how shirk or associating partners can sneak up on you. And when it comes to shirk or association in regards to the lordship of Allah, there are two categories of this. The first category are those people who simply deny the existence of Allah. They just come out and tell you they don't believe in Allah. Okay? In some of these cases, a person may reject that Allah exists. But in the, in the eternally, he doesn't. Okay? This, may, this is the case with atheists and Wiccans. I used to work with a bunch of Wiccans. They're witches. We have a high witch uh, here in Ohio. In southern Ohio, we have a large Wiccan group. A lot of people think witches don't exist. They exist, and they are recognized, and they're a religious group. And there's a lot of Wiccans. They tell you that they worship nature. They, they're quick to tell you we're not wicked. We're not evil. We, we just worship nature. You know, they don't believe in a one God. You know, they believe in Mother Nature, though. Then you come upon some Wiccans that will tell you, uh, I do believe in a higher being, but I don't think that that higher being is the only one, okay? So uh, uh, you have people uh, that negate Allah's existence, you know, in one way, but not others, okay? Also, many Muslims, how many of you know Muslims who rely on astrology? I personally know a lot of Muslims who are into this. Even a few family members. The first thing they want to know is what sign is she? What was he? What when was she born? Oh, she's a cancer. You know what that means? That means she can't control her mouth. Oh, she's a scorp. Oh, that means she got a temper on her. Oh, he's a Taurus. Oh, don't you make him mad. Oh, I ain't marrying her. Oh, no, you don't marry her. She's a Gemini. She two-faced it. I know a lot of Muslims who claim to believe la ilaha illallah, but they invalidate it because they practice horoscope, astrology. Everything is based on astrology, Supana Allah. I grew up around that. Back in the 60s when I was growing up, that was the big thing, was numerology and astrology. I mean, I know people who really take it, they don't even go out the house unless they see what the zodiac signs, what the horoscope says for them today, you know? They don't build a house. They don't go get a job. They don't do anything unless they check what the zodiac signs say. And they don't marry uh, or they don't take, they, they base their relationships on what sign are you? When is she born? When is he born? So that's why I don't tell people. When people ask me about my birthday, I don't tell them. And that's why I don't, because I, I grew up with that stuff, that astrology and numerology is all based on what your sign you a cap oh he's a cap capricorn oh no she oh no you better be a scorpio because scorpios we deadly oh i'm that two-faced human uh-uh i grew up with that crazy stuff okay this is shirk this is associating partners with Islam, with, with the law, and all your good deeds are invalidated. And this is very common in the Arabic lands too. You go to Egypt, you go to Jordan, you go to Saudi, they sit out on the streets. Women and men want to tell you your future, your fortune, okay? The tarot card readers. Even here, we got people doing matchmaking. 
Arabs are into matchmaking. You know, tell me they can they base it on astrology and numerology and they can hook you up with the best husband, the best wife. This is all witchcraft. Witchcraft, magic, all of that stuff is associating partners with a law. So it's not just the Kafirs, it's not just the Christians and Jews and atheists and Wiccans. We got to look at ourselves as Muslims. Are we into tarot card reading? Are we into astrology, zodiac signs, numerology, matchmaking? Look at all these Muslim, Muslim run matchmaking websites. First of all, it's Haram. If you want to get married, you don't go to no website to look for no husband. You're supposed to follow the Sunnah and go to your guardian. But look at all these crazy uh, uh, innovators who've created these matchmaking dating websites. These people commit shirk. And you guys are stupid enough to be a part of it. And you want to know why you can't, why, why when you do get married, you end up in divorce court. All right, so, you know, Muslims claim to believe in Allah too and his existence, but we got a many of them who deny it with that zodiac signs and, and numerology and all that crap too. And then in other Muslim countries, we got a lot of other Muslims who are not Arabic, but they come from Muslim lands as into that Buddhism and that Hinduism, Buddhism. Buddhism has been around for more than 500, 5 million, uh, has more than 5 million ad adherents and has been around for century, since the sixth century. You'd be surprised how many Muslims today still have converted to Islam, but they have brought in a lot of those Buddhism uh, characteristics and beliefs. The same with that uh, Hinduism. And just like in the time of Pharaoh, remember guys, we talked about this before, uh, Pharaoh claimed to be a person who had the power to influence others. This was associating partners with a law too. So again, we have to learn the different types, different branches of shirk because so many of us do it every day. You into that matchmaking, horoscope, numerology, any of that, you know, mother nature, then this is all sure. And then the second uh, category is, uh, you know, associating uh, partners with a law, uh, just doing it. You believe that a law is the supreme God, but there are other lesser gods. And we talked about this in another class I taught you. This theory came about uh, when the, uh, the Persian Empire, when the Persians uh, converted to Islam, many of them, this is the Ibn Sina and them, they started this Islamic theology. They took uh, the, the gods of the Greek mythology and mixed it up with Islam. The Greek mythology, they believed in lesser gods. Zeus was the, the, the main god, but there were lesser gods and demi, demi gods and all of this. This is shirk. This is associating partners with Allah. And believe it or not, we still have Muslims today who do this. Look at the Sufis. The Sufis believe basically that their sheikh is a lesser god. Basically. They believe that nothing happens unless the shake, uh, you have to go through him to make it happen. So, you know, this is very common uh, amongst Muslims today. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. They say we only worship these lesser gods so that they may bring us closer to Allah. But Allah will judge between them. And this is what the Sufis say. Those Sufis that indulge in grave worship, they indulge in, in, in their saints, they worship their sheikh. They say we only do it to get closer because they're going to bring us closer to Allah. The same thing that the Arabs, the pagan Arabs said is the same thing that these uh, shirkful Muslims are saying today. So we have to be careful with that. Okay. Hinduism, they recognize a supreme being. 
but they also believe in those uh those uh, lesser uh gods too this is shirk they use lesser gods as a means of approaching the unapproachable divinity just like the sufis they go to their sheikh and ask their sheikh to make dua for them this is why when you guys come to me and say oh sister layla make do it for me no make do it for yourself i don't make do it for anyone okay allah understands your situation better than anyone else make do it for yourself a lot of the sufis think that if you go through a righteous person a wise person that allah will hear their dua over them this is garbage this is garbage and all of this stuff came in with that when uh, uh persia after the persian people embraced islam all this different uh we're going to talk more about the Qadariya tomorrow. All this, this uh, belief came in with that as Islam spread uh, throughout Persia, throughout India, and all of that. And it's the mystic Sufis. The mystic Sufis. They're the ones that resemble the Christians more. Remember, uh, the Christianity divides the law into a trinity and all of that stuff. Well, the extreme mystic Sufis they believe that their saints you know are the lesser gods so they go to their uh saints or their sheikhs you know to pray for them and talk to allah for them and all of that okay they also believe the souls of the dead and other righteous people can affect the affairs of this world that's why you will go to some of the muslim lands you will see more shirk in the Muslim lands, and you will see here in America, you will see Muslims bringing food, putting it on the graves of dead people, talking to dead people. This is that mystic Sufi stuff. And there are more Sufis, more Sufis in the world than anything else, guys. They did a, a statistics, and a, a, what sect is the most prominent? The most prominent set of so-called Muslims in the world are the Sufis. They got more uh, groups than anyone else. And then you have these kind of people here, the grave worshipers. You know, these are the extreme Sufis too. They attribute to a human soul the ability to cause events to happen in the grave, you know, from their death, you know. And they the ones that talk to the grave, talk to the people. And when y'all listen to some of these speakers, listen to them. They'll tell you, oh, you can, you can call upon your dead grandmother. You can talk to your dead mother. She probably came to you in your sleep. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of meaning. Not equal are the living and the dead. Indeed, Allah causes to hear whomever he wills, but you cannot make those in the grave hear you or see you. But you will find many of these uh, uh, Mutazali groups, if you listen to their lectures telling you, oh, that's your mother talking to you, your father, they done came back from the dead. When Allah says you can't make them hear you or see you, they are in another world. And there's a barrier. That's what El Berzak means, the barrier, where they couldn't come back here if they wanted to. All right, so I'm gonna stop right here for today, guys. This is the um, first part of this uh, shirk that I wanna focus in on for the next couple of days. Uh, tomorrow, I'm gonna speak about some more groups, so-called Muslim groups, like the Qadariya, and how they uh, associate partners with Allah. And you guys get to see again how many of you are influenced by them. Where did this birthday stuff come from? The Mutazali, these Qadarians. They're the ones that put on the calendar, the so-called Muslim calendar, the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. These are the people that the Prophet hated before he even died. He said, these people are going to destroy this religion. These people are going to destroy this religion. These people are going to cause the people to do things, to do to me 
what they did to my brother Jesus and I'll be jiggered they're doing it the metazoli they're the ones that started this whole day and gonna worship you know celebrating birthdays and put it on the calendar boy y'all better wake up most Muslims today are influenced by them the Karajites are the fanatical terrorists they're the ones over there killing and ISIS and people okay then these other Muslims that's telling you that everything is lawful including worship of a grave and talking to dead these are the mutazali there's more mutazali than anything all right so we're going to stop right here and we're going to talk more about them tomorrow uh sipana kala huma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik are there any questions